Now I would like to begin by turning it over to Barbara Lloyd, who is on the phone, and she is going to help us start in a good way with an opening prayer. Barbara. Okay, thank you. Let us find a time of quiet and stillness and uh, open ourselves to prayer. Gracious Creator, gather us in from our busy lives. Calm our hearts and open our minds to new perspectives and new challenges. Help us to gather strength for climbing in this gathering today. Fit us for living out the journey of reconciliation as we seek to co-create a new kingdom of peace and justice in our day. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. And now we wanted to give you a chance to hear a bit of a story from the field. And so I have invited Pamela Thompson to uh, tell us a little bit about um, the campaign work that she has been doing that comes out of a long history of Indigenous solidarity that she has been engaged with. Um, to note for anyone who wasn't on the last update in December or who hasn't had a chance to read through all of the materials, most of you will know that we are working at this point education for reconciliation to work towards the fulfillment of TRC call to action number 62.1 that calls for uh, the story of residential schools, treaties, and the historical and contemporary contributions of Aboriginal peoples to be a mandatory component of kindergarten to grade 12 education. With that campaign, we have developed a number of different tools to, that we are asking for people to engage in. Uh, those tools will include visits to your provincial members of parliament, um, a mass blanket exercise in the Spring, uh, the statement that we will talk about later, an online petition, but the very first part of our advocacy work is with a paper petition that will go to each of the provincial and territorial governments. And so uh, that is our starting point and that is one of the pieces that I have asked Pamela to talk about. Pamela comes to us as a connection through uh, Church of the Redeemer Anglican in Toronto. Um, Church of the Redeemer has been part of a group of Anglican and United Churches, uh, mostly on the Bloor Street Corridor in the core of the city, uh, who have been working together on um, Indigenous solidarity uh, for a couple of years now. And I'll let her fill us in a little bit more about some of those involvements but particularly uh, where she has seen to take the campaign. And so at this point, I want you to join me in welcoming Pamela Thompson, and let's give our attention to her. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Sharon, uh, Shannon. Um, just as a little background, we've been working on the issue of indigenizing education in the pre um, college levels uh, for some time and we have met with the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs and we did meet recently with some policy people in um, Mrs. in Premier Wynne's office. Through her we are setting up a meeting with uh, two people in the Ministry of Education so uh, we're not meeting with our MPs at this point but we're trying to get right into the Minister's offices. With respect to the petition, the first thing I did was being a, 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 someone who likes things speedy and efficient, was I made the print a little smaller in the petition and uh, moved the lines a little closer so I got 10 more lines on the page and I put the address that they have to be sent to on the back. Um, I don't have the link for Kairos, but I realized recently that if I don't have a backgrounder with me, 
um, we need to have the link uh, there as well so that people can go in and print out the backgrounder once they have the petition. And then I put in great big letters, leave this side blank, uh, also on the reverse. Um, the first printing I did, I did both sides, of course, and then we, we learned that that wasn't the way to go. Um, I have that petition uh, at the back of the church along with a, a, a pile of backgrounders. One, I finished one side of one petition, that's it at the moment, and I'm not sure how many backgrounders or blank petitions have gone. Um, there's a big sign that says that we're aiming for a thousand signatures in our church, and we now have, as of this week, a, um, an announcement in our weekly bulletin uh, with the appropriate links and uh, encouraging people to pick them up on their way out. Uh, further to that, in um, in February, I hope to have people from our group stand at the back and offer them to uh, folks as they leave. Um, in February, we'll put some petitions and backgrounders into dedicated envelopes and put them in the Sunday bulletins for all our four services. Uh, I, how it's going to get taken up is hard to say. Um, because I'm not really counting how many petitions get taken or how many backgrounders get taken. Um, and if people, if I see a lot in the uh, blue bin on the way out of the church on the Sunday that we put them in, then that will give me um, pause to uh, think about it. Um, for, the, for those of you who don't know, um, our group, puts out a weekly Indigenous News Digest called WIND um, at the end of the week with links and headlines from across the country as well as posters and notices of events. If anyone wants that, um, maybe at some point I can type in the, uh, the link uh, to um, uh, our website, although it's not on the website because it's too much for the website. Uh, but I'm happy to add anyone who wants uh, to have the digest come. Um, I wrote a brief article about the petition and the campaign for our um, quarterly newsletter. And I sent a copy of that to Katie and uh, Shannon. And anyone who wants to use it and purloin it, add, put their name on it. I don't care. Uh, plagiarize it. Feel free. I plagiarize from Kairos material. So... Uh, uh, please feel free to use it to uh, put in anywhere that you feel it's appropriate. Lastly, uh, Redeemer has a website with an, an, a page dedicated to Aboriginal issues. And on that we have the, the Kairos video and the link to the petition and the backgrounder. Um, and I can put that up. I guess I can type that in as well. Uh, so we're trying to get some conversation going. We just lost our priest and said goodbye to him last Sunday. So we're all in a bit of a grieving period. And, and I'm hoping that this kind of, um, that we might generate some energy uh, in, in the uh, parish and get their minds off uh, the sad state of being priestless. Um, for a while by getting people involved in this. Uh, one of the other things that I thought about recently was that taking the way we do when we have an event, we take posters and put them um, many places along um, from the from the lakeshore to Lawrence. And I think maybe we'll sit, we'll do that in some of the churches uh, where we know there are not Kairos members. So that's what we're doing, and I'd love to, uh, if anyone else has ideas of how to turn this on, um, I'm sure we'll have time to mention that. Uh, I have to leave in about a half an hour. And that's what I have to say. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Pamela. It's great to hear from someone who is there in a conversation congregation, um, doing the work, uh, showing the way, a thousand 
signatures from one congregation would be great. We would love to have that from every congregation. We did hear again this week how the paper signatures really carry a lot of weight, more weight than a, an electronic signature. And we are so glad for your help in collecting those and your inspiration to everyone else who's collecting those. It's Dawn here. Uh, Pamela, I thank you very much for the uh, leadership you've shown. Um, some of us in the hinterland just have not yet uh, really engaged the way we should have. And uh, what you've told us about is both an inspiration to see what can be done, but also points out some really good ways that we can get directly involved uh, instead of sitting around listening to what others are doing. Thank you. Welcome. I'm trying to put it, make, make, I'm trying to make people put it in their purse and carry it wherever they go and every time they pull out their wallet they pull out the petition. <laughs> that sounds good. Delightfully subversive. <laughs> hey, thanks, Shannon. Um, so for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Katie Quinn. I work with Kairos on the Indigenous Rights Program. I'm uh, here in Ottawa on unceded Algonquin territory. And I have the great honor and privilege of introducing our special guest, um, Mr. Stephen Cassidy. So uh, he somebody who comes with a lifetime of uh, experience and knowledge and wisdom around this issue. He's president and CEO of Canadian Difference Partnership, which is an exciting new organization building bridges between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. He's the ninth premier of the North Territory. Um, he's former president of the Dine Nation, and he's also a residential school survivor and a long-time advocate for reconciliation through education. So um, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Cassidy, and um, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, uh, well, thank you, and um, Pamela, it's good to uh, hear of all the good work and thinking you're putting into this, um, this issue. And um, I thank those of you that are uh, out there doing the work we need to get done so that we see some substance to the call for changes that are being made all across this country. And the single priority that we have in um, now that there's so many movements and initiatives and uh, groups, individuals working across this country is coordination. Coordination because there are many of us trying to do many things and uh, we, we need to conserve our resources and be focused. Coordination because um, there are people who should take the initiative, who should oversee the initiatives, who need feedback and involvement with the various initiatives we have. And we need coordination so that the coordination itself becomes our reconciliation. We get to know one another. And I'm not sure that uh, we all do. Uh, I know, for instance, I know a great many more people um, in the last uh, four years than I have previously. I know organizations I never knew existed. and. Um, that's all part of reconciliation. We're engaging in a process to, to get beyond names and titles and stereotypes and deal with each other in a way that humanizes us. We have names, we have families, we have histories. And um, it's the relationship we, we, we start to develop that helps us become stronger communities, a stronger country. So um, Canadians for a New Partnership was founded uh, by myself in uh, partnership with um, the likes of Ovid Mercury, Phil Fontaine, Mary Simon from the Inuit, uh, Tony Bel Belcourt from uh, MAT, 
a group of young leaders from the Northwest Territories, as well as uh, people like Wapkinu from Manitoba, uh, Paul Martin, former Prime Minister, Joe Clark, former Prime Minister, and Michael Jean. Uh, there are many of us who um, have served this country and our people for many years, and we, we came together because uh, it was a challenge. We are so diverse. We are very busy people, and, but we also said we have to create hope, and this was in the time of the last government when Chief Trees of Spence was fasting or the protest for the absolute lack of respect and attention the government was giving to the really chronic housing conditions on the reserve. When we were watching our national indigenous leaders fighting on national TV, it, it created a real concern amongst many of our people, including my children. Uh, they were losing hope in the leaders, in the institutions, in the country. And um, my, my children asked me to do something, and so I, I called um, Paul Martin, Joe Clark, and Phil Fontaine over at Mercury, and we said, you know, we, we should come together. Let's, let's see what we could do together. We are a diverse people, but so is this country, and we're calling on the country to come together we can call on each other to come together and overcome our diversity and differences to do a, good, a few good things for this country. And we offered ourselves as leaders, as the ones to, with the high profile um, and, and credentials to uh, try to take a lead, to try to call for coordination of efforts, to uh, draw attention to the call for reconciliation, for call for attention to the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So that's, uh, that's where I come from. I'm a, a residential school survivor. I was in residential school for seven and a half years. And I've um, overcome many of the incredible negative impacts and traumas uh, through my lifetime. And so uh, at every opportunity now, I, I speak about it because I, I challenge everybody else to do the same. So whenever I'm called and asked to do that, whether it's talking to teachers for in-service and orientation programs, um, I do that. It's, um, it's a challenge that I think um, many of us who are uh, residential school survivors have to uh, to do because there's nobody else. Uh, we are the survivors. We're the ones that can share like nobody else can what that impact actually was like and uh, what we want this country to know, what we want people to know, and how to, uh, to uh, give scope to that part of our history that very few people ever knew about. And where do we go from here? That we are working on forgiveness, but it also has to change. The country has an obligation to change. And one of the things that uh, we've been absolutely uh, focused on as well from very early on is um, that recognition that we have to change the curriculum in all the schools across this country. So that every child, every Canadian, uh, gets to know who the original people of this country were. Who are the Cree? Who are the Lakota? Who are the Nakoda? Who are the Nishka and the Dene and the Inu? And where do we live? And what is our history? And that we have names. We no longer have numbers. We have names. And that. We think that is the single most important recommendation to be made that has been made by the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Because what that will do is Canadians can no longer say, we didn't know. Canadians will no longer be able to say, we don't know you. Canadians will no longer be able to say, I have no idea what a Cree is, or an Ojibwe, or a Dene. 
every child that goes through these curriculum, these schools that graduate in the generations to come, every one of them will know more than the total sum of what their mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles, grandmothers and fathers, and all of them combined ever knew about the first people of this country. So it is going to be an incredible game changer. And so I think Kairos is right to focus on that as well. Um, Canadians for a New Partnership got a letter from the three commissioners from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission asking us to take the lead in ensuring that work gets done, which means um, to meet with every government across this country, every premier, every minister, and to, to coordinate the work so that we know uh, the curriculum is brought forward, it is developed, it's done right, that is under the uh, direct involvement of the first peoples of this country, so that teachers get proper uh, in-service training and orientation, and uh, the curriculum material is developed jointly with the first people of this country. We've already done that work in the Northwest Territories. It is now completed in the Yukon. Uh, Nunavut partnered with the Northwest Territories. We, we developed that, we implement that already. And uh, the government of Alberta, as you know, announced that commitment uh, two and a half years ago, uh, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission had its national event in Alberta. We met with the Premier of Ontario a year and a half ago, who was uh, very interested in uh, doing the work, as she said at that time, to make sure that that did happen. The uh, screen just went blank. OK, so I couldn't see myself. So um, we met with the Premier of Manitoba as well. And uh, we will uh, be, uh, this coming year, in the next few months, now that the federal election is over and uh, we can all get back to some work, um, there is incredible promise of hope uh, stated by the new pr Prime Minister, by the uh, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. The amount of change that is happening across this country is, is, is happening fast. It's, it's uh, huge and it's substantial. Universities are on the move. They are making it mandatory for uh, their graduates, like the University of Manitoba, University of Winnipeg, that their graduates all have to take a course in Native Studies. So there's some real momentum. And we have to make sure we get beyond the words. I and mean, we've got the words now from the Prime Minister, from this government. And we're getting the words from, uh, like Alberta, and other uh, provinces across this country. But we have to make sure it turns into substance. And that's the work. And as I said, we need to share our resources and make sure that we're all uh, sharing the work, doing what each of us are, are, are best at. There's groups like the Legacy of Hope, the National Research Council that was set up by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that are all interested and already engaged in this work as well. So uh, Kairos, ourselves, Reconciliation Canada, Legacy of Hope, the National Research Council, amongst others. Um, with the Survivors Committee that uh, set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, with the Assembly of First Nations Leadership, the Inuit uh, organization, ITK, the Métis National Organizations, of which there's two, all have to be a part of this um, coordinating unit. So uh, we all bless and uh, share the work, coordinate so that it gets done. We're not uh, tripping over each other, uh, multiple letters being sent to the same people asking to meet about the same thing. So those are the, um, the comments I have. I, am, um, I know. Um, how little hope there was in this country is a mere three years ago. And how much hope has been created just in the last six months. And uh, we, we have an obligation to, uh, to make sure that something of substance happens. 
it is uh, it's there. The promise, the doors are open, and uh, we just need to to make sure we we do our work, we do it together, and we we share, and we network. That's part. That's our obligation. We're asking Canadians to get to know each other. Uh, we have to put some effort into getting to know one another as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, so great to have you with us because there's been so much work that's been done in your, in your own territory and uh, is a model for other places that across the country are seeking to roll out those changes. And one of the things that really stands out for me is the way that uh, survivors were involved in all parts and in the in service for the teachers. And so uh, building those partnerships and those relationships that you were talking about that are key. Uh, it's Dawn here, and I do have a comment, perhaps, rather than a question. Um, my son is a teacher in a small town in, Cal in Alberta, and uh, much of the surroundings where the students come from are agricultural. And it turns out that there is uh, a very negative uh, sense of what the uh, indigenous community has always been about within the parents. And I'm wondering how effective it is if we work only with the students uh, and give them education, but find it countered by the adults with whom they have regular relationships. Well, thank you. That is a, it's a really good question. We uh, heard a couple of years ago that uh, the estimate was that 60% of Canadians have never uh, met or had a conversation with an Indigenous person. And that uh, the vast majority of Canadians have no familiarity, no uh, knowledge of the impact of residential schools on Indigenous people, uh, the likes of Paul Martin, Joe Clark, I was asked, we did not know. Why did we not know? And uh, I also know that um, even in places like Yellowknife, where we have um, workshops and in-service training for uh, government employees and teachers, that some of them take the view, well, why do I have to know about it? What's that got to do with me? And um, there will be also people who have very, very negative uh, images of the of indigenous people and um, probably because they have very little interaction and also because uh, what they see is uh, when they drive downtown is all the the street people the indigenous people who are uh, the uh, the victims of uh, intergenerational impact of residential schools they don't uh, see the john kimbells and the steve cackways and the Phil Fontaines and all the thousands of uh, professionals that are of ancestry, uh, indigenous ancestry, they, um, they have a very negative image. And so uh, we have to find some way to focus, uh, whether it's through our churches or through our uh, community organizations, to uh, call everybody to, to deal with the issue of uh, improving relations with indigenous people. Uh, we have uh, the mayors of Vancouver, uh, I think Calgary, uh, Wetaskiwin of all places, um, just outside of Edmonton, including the city of Edmonton, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, all committed to uh, reconciliation, to uh, improving the relations between indigenous people and uh, the rest of Canada, and to find a way in those cities and municipalities to uh, to work to to make things better. And um, I know in Edmonton, the, the mayor has started orientation sessions um, of some manner for all the uh, employees of the city of Edmonton. And um, we we start where we can. We start where we're called. Um, there are uh, organizations like Reconciliation Canada, Canadians for New Partnership that need to go in and um, 
you know, there are, there are church members who uh, I know are indifferent. Um, you know, we, we had an amazing uh, six and a half years of hearings across this country about uh, something very spiritual, something very uh, a grievous, dark, ugly chapter in our history. And um, I, I know, I, I think uh, even as good Christians, sometimes we're not, uh, we don't recognize where we are called. You know, um, it's not a threat to us, it's not uh, of relevance to us, and, and we become indifferent. And um, I think it's, um, it's unfortunate, but we start with one person where we can. We start with two, we start with three, and um, I really uh, recognize, I mean, that's, that's where the need is. And it's amazing, um, you know, what a, a sharing circle can do. It's amazing what uh, bringing uh, keynote speakers to the churches can do. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I've, I've been to church uh, more times in my life than I like to think. It was mandatory in the, all the years I was in residential school. And um, I've heard all the sermons. I've, I've, I've uh, come to memorize many, many chapters in the, in the Bible. And, um, but you know, we, we, we need to invite each other in. And, um, you know, the Lutherans and the United Church people and the Pentecostals have to bring other people in. And it means inviting indigenous people into your churches to give you a, a talk. Um, as they say, give us back our talk. Then um, that's a way to do it. You know, petitions are great. Um, I hope you pull it off. Uh, but we need more than signatures. We need people to open their minds and to say, you know what, actually, I don't know anybody that's indigenous. I'd like to. Um, maybe people are afraid to ask, so their ministers need to do that. Go ahead. Whoever's I do feel that the answers that you've given are appropriate, and uh, many of us do know that. But uh, if we are to try and to make uh, an impact uh, fairly quickly across the country, I think we probably need to find ways to deal with some of the adult organizations, as you suggested, uh, at the same time as we're pressing for education formally to happen within the school systems. So maybe some of us that are part of Kairos and of church organizations or whatever, might look at uh, some of the business organizations that we may also be affiliated with and uh, talk to the adults there, uh, whether it's a union or uh, a professional society or uh, whether it's uh, an agricultural community and, and some of their organizations. Uh, we probably need to have some emphasis on the parallel work with adults uh, as we do uh, try to modify the opinions of those who will be the adults of our near future uh, so that we don't take quite so many generations to get everybody on board. But thank you for your comments. Just to add, um, if you have a specific community in Alberta where you think somebody like myself could, uh, if I had the time, um, would be able to uh, address such a, uh, a community, I would uh, be interested because it doesn't matter whether it's 20 people or 300, if there's a call and um, I can do it, somebody else can do it, then we will, uh, we will uh, try to honor that. I should tell you, we want to focus on the lawyers, the doctors, the medical uh, workers, the nurses, We've already talked to the Aboriginal Nurses Association of Canada. We've talked to the Indigenous Bar Association. We um, want to focus on the professions all across this country. So uh, yes, we, we need to uh, sort of uh, bring focus to, uh, as you call it, the, the adult the institutions across this country. And um, again, coordination and um, 
is, is going to be key, uh, as well as the thousands of Syrians and other immigrants that we're uh, welcoming and inviting into this country uh, annually. That's a worthwhile challenge. We will try to set up some stuff that uh, will uh, respond to those kind of opportunities. And of course, uh, Joe Clark lives uh, about uh, not more than 100 kilometers south of Calgary, for instance, and uh, uh, certainly seems to be showing uh, uh, a real commitment to this work. And he's a good speaker uh, when you want to listen. And uh, But I'm sure that uh, the coordination uh, is the other aspect that's important. And so we don't want to go off doing something on our own. As our plans may develop, we'll stay in touch and see uh, uh, what sort of advice you may be able to contribute to the uh, attempts that we're making to reach some of these groups. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So another question that came in on the chat was um, Esther, I think you said that 62 was the most important, and she was wondering if you could elaborate on why you see call to action 62 is the most important. The, um, the call to action that is most important, I think, is, is because ignorance is the base of racism, is the base of uh, indifference and apathy. Uh, ignorance of a people, of individuals, dehumanizes. It dehumanizes uh, you, it dehumanizes the person that you do not recognize, you never speak to, you have no idea what their names are. And um, we've been uh, the subject of that for a long time. And we know, for instance, in the Northwest Territories, that uh, we had elected people in the past. Uh, I know of one MLA, for instance, who was elected who had never been outside the city boundaries of Yellowknife. There's uh, over 30 communities. There's Inuit, Inuvialuit, Métis, Satu, Gwich'in, Akecho, Klisho, people, all different people living, very diverse community in, in the Northwest Territories. And this MLA was actually elected, having never been outside the city of Yellowknife, to vote on laws and, and, and money for all communities of which he had absolutely no idea. And it is to avoid that that we, we started this work many years ago to change the curriculum. And um, the outcry was from actually the city of Yelma, the parents saying, our, we don't want our kids to know about you people. We don't need them to know about who lives in the Arctic coast. We don't care who, who lives along the Richardson Mountains. Um, our kids are going to school in the south and they're going to be uh, lawyers and engineers and teachers. But we said that's fine, but um, they're not going to graduate. They're not going to have a certificate unless they take a course that uh, they can go to school in the south and say, yes, I know who the New Value are. I know who the Akecho and the Decho people are. And in spite of the outcry, uh, we held our ground and so it was mandatory. And who would come back two years later and be proud of the fact that they came from the Northwest Territories were those very same kids that came out of Yelma. Going to school in Dalhousie, going to school in Calgary, going to school in Vancouver and Victoria who said, we were really proud and able to say, we know who the New Valley are, we know who the Gwich'in and the Decho are. And we know where the Great Bear Lake is. And they were proud to, to say, we know. This is, we're from the Northwest Territories, and we know our peoples. The pride and the, uh, the ability to say, we know, is, uh, was incredible. And now it's a non-issue. Everybody takes pride in, in that. Uh, the parents, they might be still as ignorant as they were 10 years ago when we implemented it. But definitely their kids are not. And um, 
even as we speak, I mean, every day the children that are going to school in Yellowknife and in Fort Good Hope and all the communities across the Northwest Territories, they know more than even some of us indigenous people uh, know about each other. And so uh, it, is, it is proving to, to make a stronger place, a stronger community. And in what's happened in the North is happening in the Yukon, it's happening in Nunavut, and it will happen across Canada. Getting to know each other, getting to know our strengths, our differences, um, the cultural values we carry, our attitude towards each other as neighbors, towards our resources, uh, the development of those resources, the economy, um, education institutions are all things that are of fundamental importance to us. And we think we will convince people that uh, getting to know not one another, we will see uh, less controversy, roadblocks, uh, fights, protests than uh, we have in the past. There will be less incarceration, there will be less taxing of uh, governments uh, for all the havoc um, that has been created in the last 150 years through residential schools. If, if I could add one more thing, the, uh, the thing that we've got to focus on and we've been meeting with some of the national leaders already is the, uh, the call to action to set up a national council um, that would oversee the implementation of the uh, 94 calls to action. The Prime Minister has already committed to uh, implement all 94 recommendations, which means to me that he's saying he will uh, look at the setting up of a national council to, to implement the 94 recommendations to oversee the implementation of those. And um, we, met, we met with uh, the, the National Inuit leadership yesterday. We've, we've talked with the Assembly of First Nations leaders for the last few months about it. We've met with the Métis, uh, one of the Métis leaderships about it. So uh, we are calling for uh, people to uh, coordinate an effort to get the Prime Minister to, uh, to commit specifically to setting up the National Council as soon as possible and um, to make sure that everything we do, uh, whether it's in BC or Manitoba or Halifax, that we coordinate, we make sure that the national organizations are aware on site that the Survivors Committee, which set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission are on site, partners like Kairos, uh, Reconciliation Canada, Canadians for a New Partnership, amongst others, our university partners, Everyone is part of a network in that we, uh, we, we uh, do things respectfully so people are not left out and um, given the respect they deserve for the, the offices they hold. And right now it's the, um, the uh, National Commi Survivors Committee that I think will fulfill that role on a, on a, on a spiritual level as well as the national organizations. It's Barbara Lloyd here. Not so much a question, but um, thanks, Stephen, for all of your work and for your conversation today. But um, just thinking, you know, reading an article today in the CBC about a quarter of the population of uh, federal prisoners are Aboriginal. And our own people who are, you know, not in the school system, I mean, their children and grandchildren, as Dawn says, will benefit. But there's something about um, learning and knowing uh, new, uh, Aboriginal people, Indigenous people, that will help us to bring new relationships. But there's some, I think, lingering feeling sometimes out of our lack of being able or willing to look at how we as uh, white Canadians have been part of colonialism and that colonialism continues to exist within the structures and systems, which will be, you know, slowly through living out the recommendations of the TRC, we're hoping to change all that. But I think it's, you know, some of the old stereotypes are still in people's minds. And so it, as well as learning about who Aboriginal people and Indigenous people are, I think it's also learning to understand what 
uh, residential schools have actually done. And this is like post-traumatic stress syndrome, and it's not something that goes away quickly. And therefore, it has had, you know, generational effects. And, you know, we've been a part of, of uh, creating the institutions that, that uh, created. So there's a place of lament that we need to be part of as, as uh, white Canadians, I think, in all this, and especially as our churches. So just a comment that along with a very good and practical petition, um, we need to do some spiritual reflection and uh, our own work, perhaps, um, even before we bring Aboriginal speakers in, too. So there's a question here in the chat. Um, Robert's asking, is anyone working on overhauling the under welfare system in particular as it demoralizes young adults? And um, you should have, like, real economic development. I don't know that there's any um, hard and fast answers. I mean, some of the uh, communities we have back up in the Northwest Territories and Nunavut, uh, as well as many reserves in the south. I mean, the, the reason the governments set up the reserves in those places was not because they were loaded with oil and uh, diamonds and, and gold. It was because, for the most part, they knew damn well there was nothing there. And um, now um, those communities have been isolated for generations and we're expecting them to, to come out of there and uh, become economically viable. And we chastise them for uh, being a big drain on uh, the federal coffers. It is a changing dynamic, though, because if you go to uh, Edmonton and Calgary, you go to Saskatoon and Winnipeg, you will see a, a new dynamic there, as uh, I've been watching uh, in the city of Yelme, where young people, like my children, are connecting with the children from all the different regions. So what you see in the city of Yelme, for instance, is a group called Denenaho. And they are uh, not from one tribe. They're intertribal. They, uh, they are Cree. They are Gwich'in, Akecho, Satu, Métis. And they're saying, by circumstance, we are our community. We are not of the same tribe. We are intertribal, but this is our community. And together, we're pledging to work together to regain our pride, regain our culture, get to know uh, one another's history, and work together. And uh, you're starting to see that in uh, Winnipeg. You're starting to see that in uh, Saskatoon, where uh, 20 years ago, even as far back as 20 years ago, you couldn't get Métis talking to uh, Ojibwe, and Ojibwe weren't talking to Lakota, or Cree, or Dene. Um, they're setting those things aside. They, that's not relevant for them anymore. The, the, the uh, movement is not what's going on in reserves only. It is also off reserve in the cities. And um, overwhelming majority of our people are now in those places. Um, I don't think anybody has a quick answer as to what to do on the reserves. Most of us in the Northwest Territories don't have reserves, but we have communities like reserves that are I isolated, that have limited economic viability. And uh, there we always try to focus on supporting traditional economy of hunting and trapping. And um, we've, we've tried to uh, focus some... Uh, some of our work there, reconnecting to the land, is the single biggest spiritual uh, uh, connection that we, we can help uh, the, the indigenous people make. It's uh, that unique perspective that indigenous people inherently have about their place in the universe, that they are just part of the universe, not separate from it, not dominant over it, and not a, a separate species, but just part of the whole incredible wonder of uh, creation. Short question, long answer, sorry. And I think it's a nice uplifting note to end on. Um, 
I want to say once again, again what an honor to have, to have you with us, to have uh, one of the leaders in this country on the, on the issues that we're working on, on and to really, really respond to that call that you put out that we work in a coordinated way, that we let each other know what's happening so that um, our impact can be more and so that it's also an opportunity to build those relationships that are key for any of this going ahead in a good way. So um, having you with us is definitely a good step towards that and I really thank you for accepting your invitation. And thank you and um, those of you that are out there, you know, don't ever feel alone. It's uh, always possible to connect with somebody and we can um, make a commitment to try uh, all we can to, to, to go to your community, to go to your, your houses if we need to make that connection because uh, it's, it's not a good thing to be alone to, uh, to uh, have hope diminish. We, we can do it and uh, we'll do it together. Thank you. Um, so what, what we want to do is we want to show you the statement and encourage you to reach out to um, organizations that you work with, organizations that you, um, where there are people there that you know who you think would want to put their name behind this um, Education for Reconciliation action and show their support by putting their name to, to a public statement that we'll post on the website and we'll just, we'll keep adding, um, We'll keep adding names of organizations so that we hope to have a really good list um, that really represents how much momentum there is for, for seeing this happen. So I'm going to pull up the statement now. This is Shannon here. So just to reiterate as Katie is, is pulling it up, this, this piece we're thinking of as a, an opportunity for organizations. So we will be sending this to um, significant organizations, uh, unions, um, various uh, federations and organizations, um, and NGOs that are like-minded and can, um, can lend their name and logo um, and will stand with us on this particular uh, quest for fulfillment of the uh, Call to Action 62.1. It's Barbara here. Um, are you then, as Kairos, uh, does it automatically go with all of the, you know, the member denominations and organizations of Kairos? Is that listed there, or do you have to ask them uh, separately as well? That's something I'll need to turn back to Katie, and I'm not sure that we have worked out that particular piece yet, but um, we will get back to you on that one. So this is, um, this is what it says. In June of 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, TRC, released 94 calls to action to guide us towards a repaired relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples and a more just and equitable future. The TRC concluded that education is key to reconciliation. It has the potential to end in one generation of profound ignorance about our history that continues to perpetuate intolerance and racism. We support the Kairos and Legacy of Hope Foundation campaign for urgent implementation of TRC 62-1, which calls for the federal, provincial, and territorial government in consultation with Indigenous peoples to make age-appropriate curriculum on residential schools, treaties, and Aboriginal peoples' historical and contemporary contributions to Canada, mandatory education requirement for kindergarten to grade 12 students. The proposed curriculum change, where Indigenous wisdom is the foundation, will transform both the education system and Canadian society. Knowing and understanding the truth about our collective past is an important step towards a brighter, more positive, more respectful future. We believe that with the truth, we can touch both the hearts and minds of, Can of Canada's children so that they can become leaders in building the reconciliation our country so desperately needs. So that's, that's how the statement reads. Um, once we have some sign-ons, we'll post it on the website, and then we'll continue adding new names of organizations um, as, we, as they come in. For, we don't have a hard deadline at this point, but um, you know, 
for the next few months at least. So um, is there any, any feedback or questions or comments? I wanted to comment again that um, we, we have our, our direct uh, lines of communication to our member churches. What we're hoping that those of you on this call might uh, begin to help us with is other connections to uh, large organizations um, such as unions or uh, boards of education or um, universities or what have you. Who, um, who would be interested in this topic and who uh, would be able to stand with us on this endeavor. So when we send around this statement to different organizations, we'll be giving them a whole, uh, a whole series of ways that they can spread the word with, to their own network and their members. So we're hoping to really um, increase the impact of the campaign in that way so people can um, share the link to the online petition, they can print off and share the hard copies of the petition, um, use the hashtags on Twitter. Um, engage people in the mass blanket exercises that will be happening in there um, if they if they happen to live near one of the provincial capitals or in a provincial capital. So um, so we hope that the statement as a way is a first step to get lots of other organizations involved in all aspects of the campaign. And Barbara here, I mean, I hope you're approaching people like the teachers unions and things like that directly, not waiting for somebody to volunteer to do that. But I mean, that would be a logical co connection, it seems to me, Various the various teachers unions. Yeah, yeah, certainly we're reaching out to, um, I think especially we'll be reaching out at the national level and be working yeah. through some of our provincial point people for um, some of those provincial organizations. Um, but it always helps um, when there are personal connections. So if, if people do happen to have personal connections to um, some of these organizations, definitely that's a, that's a plus. And uh, will we reach out to the theological schools and presbyteries and that and such? The, um, from here, we will start, as Katie said, um, at the national level um, in, in each of the sectors um, and then to the provincial level. In terms of individual presbyteries and such, um, we, would, we will welcome that, but that's uh, beyond our capacity to uh, do individually, although we are sending a mailing to those who are have been in contact with us and we have their addresses. So um, there will be a paper mailing to all of our Kairos communities um, and volunteers that we're connected with. That will be a starting point, but in terms of this statement, we will be uh, reaching out at the national level, but we will welcome your assistance. Um, when it comes to a campaign of this size, we are actually a fairly small staff, and so uh, we, we welcome your um, suggestions or your direct contacts where you can. Um, particularly, you mentioned the theological schools, and we do not have contacts with all of those. Uh, we have in a few places, but not with all of them, and so if you have connections we would, uh, you know, an email to the right person that we get CC'd on would be very helpful. But Shannon, it's Barbara here again, I'm sorry. This should be something that goes through the denominations. And, you know, by sending a note to Christy Neufeld or I and I, we can find the ways to get to the schools and give you all that information or send it to them directly. Okay. It, um, of course, in every situation with each of our members, we have, um, you know, we're finding the right moments and the right uh, people. And so I, I appreciate that commitment, Barbara, and we will, um, we will pass this on to you so that you can pass it to those schools. Yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, I just think staff are our first place to start, even if they're not the end place. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Katie and Shannon. And uh, let's let's close our time together with prayer. Creator God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, to listen, to learn, to be inspired for this work of reconciliation. We thank you for the winds of change that are blowing across our land, reconciling winds, winds of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for signs of hope and change, even as we know there is much, much further to go. We thank you for signs of authentic friendship and reconciliation and relationship. We thank you for people like Stephen Kakfui and the Canadians for a New Partnership. We thank you for the Cairo staff and community. And we thank you for all other people across this land who are working for change. Bless our efforts. May the wind continue to blow strong and fresh and filled with hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Esther, for helping us close in a good way. And thanks, everyone, for joining us.